Thank you so much for that. Uh, okay, so as, as maybe, for, just, uh, I, I don't think okay. Jacob will be able to make it. Uh, well, how much time did we have? Uh, well, I think we can stretch it for 20, 30 more minutes, uh, including okay, questions. So maybe, so, so maybe what I could ask is that uh, let's take questions for for Stormway because the in the first uh, set of uh, slides we're just giving an overview for a programmatic activity. So maybe we can take questions for for um, post presentation. All right. The the floor is open, people. If you have a question, maybe you can ask. All right, uh, Nox has two questions, I think. Nox, uh, yeah. Um, thank you, uh, thank you so much for that talk. And uh, thank you, Doc, for, for this uh, invite again. I've got two questions. Uh, the first, can you get me? Yeah. Yes, the first question yes, I can is, get you. Um, I just want to understand how you do feature selection when you uh, identifying or picking what variables you use or work with um, at, at the stage before you even reach maybe to, to building your final model. And then uh, the other question I have is uh, regarding um, logistic regression. What is the main okay. type of logistic regression you employ when you're coming up with that model? Is it binomial or or do you know, they maybe take both of them. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, is it Nox for your questions? Uh, if I got your first question correctly, um, you are asking what more, more or less a criteria of what variables to choose to include in the model, is that correct? Yes, how, how do you identify variables like how do you come up with a feature selection? How do you pick what variables you're going to work with? All right, nice, nice, thank you. All right, so so, uh, so, uh, maybe what I can say is we, every research project uh, is intended to answer specific research questions, right? So based on the objectives that have been set, right? Uh, like for example, for the Agile project, we are trying to understand the burden of TB in these prisons but you are kind of flagging overcrowding as a main risk factor to getting TB. So number one, you've already identified two variables of interest here. Uh, the exposure variable being overcrowding and the outcome variable being TB, okay? So that's your first two variables, right? Now, we all know, like I mentioned, uh, when you are trying to look for an association between the exposure variable and the outcome variable, you have to consider confounders, right? So you start asking questions like, what other characteristics of these individuals in this prison can uh, influence the effect estimate, right? Being that the effect estimate being the odds ratio, right? So that's how come I talked about issues of age, I talked about issues of sex, uh, HIV infection, um, BMI, BMI being whether someone is uh, underweight, normal weight, or overweight, right? So you 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 get all these various, and 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 basically you have to look at what you have as a data set, right? And you try identify, uh, hopefully, um, all the possible confounding variables, right? And uh, you have to go through a process where you check for the association first between an exposure and an outcome, like we did with HIV and TB there, then. The next step is that you try to adjust for that association. If the odds ratios change, right, either going up or going down, uh, and they're not the same, you know that that variable is a confounder, and hence it should be included in your final model. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, it does. Yeah. So you, you, you start including, so you'll be testing various types of variables. You test okay. one, you see okay. if there's a change in the OR, if it increases, reduces, you add it to the, you, 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 you note it so that it's included in the final model. Uh, there are other issues I didn't touch on, issues to do with effect modification. 
uh, that's another uh, topic for another day. You you have to also test for effect effect modification uh, using what they call likelihood ratio tests to see whether uh, the for those uh, for example for the group of HIV infected or uh, not infected individuals is there a difference in the odds in those groups? If there's a difference, what you would want to do is present that difference to your audience. If there's no difference, even an adjusted odds estimate, it, it, odds ratio estimate is, is sufficient for your for your audience. Um, your second question, sorry, <laughs> I missed your second question. Okay, um, my second uh, question uh, on, uh, on uh, logistic regression, the, the type of logistic yeah. regression you use. My understanding is, yeah. uh, I think there are three, if I'm not mistaken, there is binomial, which, which will enable you to just code uh, two variables, either a zero or a one. And then um, okay. we we'll have maybe we can give you maybe uh, I can say maybe three or more possible types to code yeah. which are not ordered. Yes. Let's say for example yeah. disease A, disease B, and disease C. And then the last one mm. is ordinal, which which can also maybe give you three options depending on uh, the the ordering categories you're making. So I just wanted to understand if you employ all the three types of logistic regression or you just uh, again pick one which will suit to the objectives of your project exactly your last uh, uh, statement answers the question okay. uh, the idea is you yeah the, the idea is uh, you you pick one that will answer your 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 study objectives right okay. so uh, I think it's rare. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not an, a, 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 an, an expert in this, like ex expert, like a hundred percent. But I, I don't think that. Um, I think most models will contain at least, and I mean at least two variables. No. Most models, like logistic regression models, will have multiple variables that you're adjusting for. Okay. So mm -hmm. you have, um, of course, your main outcome. In this case, as an example, we're saying TB and the main exposure being uh, overcrowding. But in addition to that, you will have those other uh, variables that are supposed to be adjusted for. So it's it's rare, only when you're doing uh, uh, some just binomial analysis, like you put it, if you're just, if you just want to see a crude association and crude being, you have not adjusted for it. Uh, you, 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 you can just do a logic, logistic regression, which has only two variables. Right, yeah, you, that image odds uh, statement that I put into Stata, right? If I, actually, let me try this. Uh, are you able to see my screen? I just quickly demonstrate yeah. that. Uh, yeah, let me, is my screen still being shared? No, you probably have to share. Uh, so yeah, let me for, do it quick. As, as it's showcasing this, uh, if I can just jump in briefly, uh, just a note to the current CSC 57 foot one student. Uh, what Knox is a senior student, right? He's, he's, he's way ahead of, uh, of most of us here. Um, but very soon we'll have an in depth discussion of so called feature extraction and feature selection. Right? So, if you notice a table that um, Paul was showcasing with those different variables, um, those will be tied to your feature extraction process where you identify all the different variables that you could potentially work with. And then you then go through a feature selection process where you identify the most important variables that will help you attain your objective, right? And so, so discuss things are doing value selection and feature important and all those things. So just sort of um, note that, right? Uh, so it's coming very soon, soon understand this. All right, thanks, Doc. Uh, so to, uh, Knox, I don't know if you can see the screen, yes. but in that uh, the odds ratios uh, in both the image, the Manso Hanso uh, method, which was this command here, okay, and the, the odds ratio, you've seen the, the, the odds ratios are the same. Mm -hmm. You get the point. There's this one here and this one here. But remember, this logistic, this is the, actually a model <laughs> with only two variables in it. Yeah. Right? So that's the reason why we're getting the same result. But ideally, what would you want to do, or what you obviously do, is that this logistic uh, regression model will have other parameters uh, that are adjusting for for the association between the main exposure and and the outcome. 
right? Okay. So yeah, you see, and, and and basically you'd see the effect estimates of each of those parameters in this table. Right now, it's only showing us this uh, effect estimate, but this um, other estimate here is not really important. Uh, the constant it's not really important. You cannot interpret it actually. But uh, basically, you see the odds ratios for the other uh, variables that you add in, and of okay. course the related uh, p values and uh, confidence intervals. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Edward. Thanks for your question. Okay. Yeah. So if I can just piggyback on Knox's question here, do, do you the, yeah. the feature selection process? Do you do this yourselves? Um, you know, as part of these pipelines that you work with, or maybe you have experts that will occasionally chime in to say, could you perhaps uh, use these variables because we suspect that uh, you know, there's a strong correlation when you take them into account. I don't, I don't okay, thanks, Doc, for the question. Yeah, it, it does make sense. Uh, so uh, mostly these research projects uh, uh, include uh, 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 people from different backgrounds, right? Of course, you have your study PI, who's kind of the the head of the project, and um, obviously had spent so much time, uh, with, of course, with other individuals writing the study protocol and obviously the objectives. And you also have uh, statisticians as well as public health specialists, doctors, clinicians, and the like. And and basically, when you're coming up with an analysis plan, it's good that you meet as a team so that you all have the same message. So uh, to answer your question, you need various input from various people. Uh, uh, as an epidemiologist alone, you, you cannot kind of make some of these decisions, uh, but you can apply your knowledge together with others' knowledge to come up with um, final models and, and, the, and the like. I hope that answers your question, Doc. Yes, it does. I think Richard had a question in the chat. I don't know if he's coming. Uh, Richard. Yes, as we're waiting for Richard, I have a question with regard to. Yeah, as we're waiting for Richard, I don't know if he's going to respond. But do, do you think that some of these things, these pipelines that you've created, do you think that they can be plotted so that. Uh, you know, like experts working in the, in the public sector can perhaps uh, try and appropriate them and be able to make use of them? Or are, are they so uh, tied to, to specific research questions that you aim to address? Uh, so can they be repurposed so that somebody in the public sector can maybe make a few alterations and be able to use them? Uh, I don't know if I, I, I completely get your question. Um, maybe if you could ask it again, maybe in a different way. Are you kind of related to the juvenile project, right? Where you are, you, you're mm -hmm. trying to, to, I guess, to, to a certain extent, classify people that are more at risk or something. Can, can that thing yes. be utilized, uh, let's say, at UTH, where, and I know it's not a, it's not a prison per se, but if you look at the different, demographic details that you focus there. Um, mm -hmm. they're, they're more or less, I mean, they're, they're more or less common if the, some of them are common if the average person. Like the, the question then is, yeah. do you think that we can we can take that thing and be able to make minor alterations and use it in, in a completely different setting? That's the question. Correct, you, you could do that, Doc. Um, uh, like, I, like I said, um, I think it, it, if there's a question to answer, a research question to answer, you can easily do that. Uh, but of course, you, you, every study design, for example, most of this is done in, in studies, right? Every study design uh, follows different types of analysis, right? So if let's say you took it to UTH, uh, for what purpose? Is it that you want to carry out a study on, on, on something? You want to ascertain the burden of a certain disease, right? So you would have to, um, of course, come up with a sample size of some sort and uh, do some sort of statistical analysis and the like. Yeah, you could actually, yeah, you could actually use it anywhere, but uh, I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you. Are, are there yeah. any other questions? I don't know if people have questions in the chat Richard, here. Richard, I don't know if question. Paul is going to join us, actually. But... 
Maybe we can use this time to just ask questions if it's not coming. Yeah. Okay. Is it Adib as a question? Yeah, uh, yeah, the name is Zola. Apologies for the, the online screen name. So I just have a, a random question, though, about the ownership of the data. It seems to me that you're working with the prison, right? You can ask the question is, does the data belong to the prisoners or the prison itself? And in particular, the, do the prisoners get to have a say as to, like, whether you can use their data? All right, thank, thanks for the question. Yeah, so before you start um like any study or a programmatic activity that uh, requires dissemination of uh, results you have to cut you it has to go through uh, several uh, reviews uh, first ethics has to review what exactly you're trying to do is it ethical for you to carry out such a project and of course in 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 the ethical review process you, your documentation will indicate who will have access to the data? Uh, uh, I think uh, the health uh, is it NHA here in, in in Zambia has a requirement that you are supposed to disseminate uh, results uh, locally before you can disseminate them uh, to the rest of the world. So yeah, um, your, your the documentation uh, specifies agreements between um, the various stakeholders, the prisoners. Uh, and, and of course, actually, when you're screening the prisoners, you you have to get consent uh, for, for for their data or their information to be right. They would have to consent to to certain uh, 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 issues that you're proposing to say, okay, uh, this information, as much as we're going to present it to uh, the international people, the local people, uh, at the same time, we're not going to identify that you actually have HIV or you actually have TB. So there's a lot of um, documentation, I can say, that clearly s specifies what you should do and what you shouldn't do. Yeah. So if, if I can just follow up Zola's question, by the way, uh, it's to do with data, but of course, very to do with consent and, and ethics. Um, yes. If, 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 we wanted to, if we wanted to use the data that you collect, what process would we have to go through? Um, we've got into a stage where we are tired working with uh, toy data sets. And I, I think that mm -hmm. you guys are probably one of the few entities we have in the country that collect massive amounts of data. So in the event that we wanted mm -hmm. to, of course, I mean, you'd probably have to anonymize information. But mm -hmm. Is it possible, did it be possible for us to gain access to these data sets that you collect? And if so, I mean, what sort of yeah. process would we have to go through? Yeah, so here at CIDAS, we have uh, a policy in place uh, that uh, in the event that you want to make use of some of the data that we, we house, you would have to kind of uh, be screened, if I could use for lack of a better term, like where you specify exactly what data you want, uh, what is it going to be used for, uh, even if you're going to publish it, um, what um, is, is it, uh, are you going to acknowledge the fact that Ciders was involved in the whole process of giving you the data and the like. So yeah, you 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 can you can have access to, but of course it's subject to the policy in place. So if certain um, issues in your application or text does not um, uh, meet the criteria of you getting that data you requested for, uh, then you won't be given that data. But people have come through uh, from various uh, parts of the world it that way who requested for smart care data and also research data to be specific and uh, yeah uh, some have been given some not uh, due to certain reasons yeah hello maybe i just i can chime in here a bit yeah more so. yeah so so essentially uh, almost all public health data uh, within our country, belongs to the Ministry of Health. Yeah, that's sort of like the starting point. So, if we are conducting um, a research study and we are collecting data, that uh, I don't know why I'm getting a lot of echo. Is it to myself? Mm. Oh, no, I okay. So, uh, when we are conducting a research study. 
um, and the data that we're collecting is not um, routine data that's collected in the clinics. But of course, even before we get there, we need to get ethical clearance from uh, the National Health Research uh, Board, and also we need um, the same clearance from uh, UNSA BREC. In the event that um, another partner wants to review that data, who is not Ministry of Health, uh, they would have to put in um, uh, ethical clearance as well. So if they do have that ethical clearance and they're given a go-ahead by the National Research Authority to have access to that data, then we would be able to share them. Um, outside that, we would be unable to share with them. And if that does not in any way um, compete with our interests, or those of the Ministry of Health. And if it's ourselves, we'll have to uh, also maybe uh, if what we want was not necessarily in the original analysis plan, uh, or we want to do something with our data, maybe we want to collect it, we would have to also put in an, um, a protocol amendment, sort of like uh, through the National Health Research Authority. So. So I think the first question, like, who owns the data? Is it the prisoners? Uh, I don't know the correct answer to that, but we know in terms of who are the custodians um, and uh, who are the or who are the, in terms of governance overall, it's really the Ministry of Health. Um, we are temporal custodians for the maybe two, five years that we stipulated in the protocol that we'll have the data. And after that time period, we actually, I don't know, some protocols would say we'll destroy the data or that we'll hand it over to the Ministry of Health. Uh, so it depends. Also, it's quite specific on, um, uh, on, a, on what study is being conducted. Yeah. I, I always assume the, I mean, the data that these hospitals collect about me, I just use without my consent for research, right? I mean, I... I imagine yeah, myself so, visiting a private hospital. I'm sure that data is used for research, and, and I don't have never consented to the data being used. So, I'm surprised, so I that, think, uh, I'm actually surprised that you asked for consent from the prisoners here. I'm shocked. Uh, but, yeah, so, so uh, in Zambia, I think, which is the case with, uh, with the rest of the world, uh, any data you collect on patients, the patient has to give consent. Uh, of course, there are instances when you are doing sort of like, historical, you're, you're, you need historical data and you can go back and um, consent patients. Even for that one, you still need clearance from, um, uh, from, from uh, the National Health Research Board. Uh, then there are also instances where you are not using the data for research purposes, but you're using it to sort of understand, like say for instance, during this COVID period, you are, you're, you're using for maybe for surveillance, you're using it for to improve clinical care. Uh, you, you're using it right at the clinic to really generally improve clinical care. That's something else. Uh, you're using for surveillance. That's something else. Uh, but even in some instances for surveillance, you need sort of like to have a protocol in place, which the National Health uh, Research Board um, authorizes. But I must say that uh, this is also what I'm saying. I'm trying to recall the different things I've been writing lately. Uh, but there are quite strict rules around how the data is used, who has access to the data. You need to have to go through a lot of processes before anyone can have access to the data. In fact, when we're doing data analysis and when we have it at um, sort of at SQ, it has to be de-identified. Uh, it's only identified at facility level. Yeah, and uh, any person who sees uh, the identified data, uh, it must be that they provide a direct service to the client. Yeah. Sort of that's sort of like the the, the issues around uh, patient confidentiality, data privacy, and sort of data ownership and governance, which is pretty interesting because the the presentation that uh, Paul Somwe gave was a research presentation. It's not necessarily um, related to routine data that's collected on patients, but it's a uh, it's, it's data that uh, you say we want to collect through, uh, during this time period for this purpose. And after we've achieved what we want, we've done publications, we'll have the data for five or so years, and then we'll destroy it. Uh, the presentation that Jacob was going to give was mostly for routinely collected data on patients. Um, 
And from our angle, um, mostly uh, patients on HIV treatment. Uh, so, and that's data that's collected in the national um, EHR system, smart care. I hope most of you have heard it. So again, the, the rules around management of that data is that it belongs to the Minister of Health. Anything we want to do on it, we need to seek permission from the Minister of Health. Unless it's for direct service delivery and we are involved in the activities right at the clinic. And if we want to do any research on the same data that's being collected, we need to get uh, clearance and uh, ethical approval from uh, the National Health Research Board. I hope that answers some of the questions, but doesn't leave you more confused. Thank you. I think there are, there are questions in the chat. Uh, also, as, as, as I don't know if Paul, we can read the questions, but is, is Jacob going to... Yeah. Uh, so I, I, don't I, can just I don't know if we still have time. I can, uh, without slides, I can just quickly give a brief overview of the processes and the like. I can just okay. give a brief overview and hopefully my explanation will be good enough to paint a picture of what Jacob was going to do. Okay, there's, there's that, and then the other option is we could have the part two. Uh, I think we have the slot next week, uh, and another slot yeah. next week, so I, I don't know, but it's up to you. That, that's, that's brilliant, uh, that's brilliant. Yeah. Jacob can do it. At the time, maybe we can have Jacob prepare, and then we can have the part two or something. That's, that's better. All right, uh, Richard, uh, Richard uh, had challenge faced with two analysis, two an analysis of data. I'm not sure I understand your question, Richard. Are you asking what the challenges we face? Uh, Richard, I don't know if you're able to use a microphone or... Mm -hmm. So, Paul, I think that uh, we was probably trying to find out like uh, what are the specific challenges we face with the data collection tools you use, with the data analysis tools you use, or the processes of uh, data analysis, what challenges do you face? I think that's probably what he's trying to find yeah. out. Yeah, maybe but if I can add on another angle to that also. Uh, so one of the things yeah. we've already discussed uh, in class is the, the different phases that you you go through when undertaking a data mining project. And uh, so if you read up on literature, for instance, they'll cite uh, things as, uh, data preparation. Uh, so this whole process of uh, cleaning up the data as being the most involving task. Uh, I'm not sure yeah. if Richard's question is more tied to that, but if you could maybe let us know which of the different things you do is the most challenging and the most involving. Is it data collection? Is it data cleaning? Is it the analysis part? Um, so just adding up to Richard's question. Yeah. So uh, to answer your question, um, I, I, I feel if you develop a data collection tool, necessary validations in place, uh, and once you start using that data collection tool, you uh, on a weekly basis consistent, consistently verify the data that's been entered and validate it, uh, you'll find that your cleaning process will be will be much. Uh, you you won't have you won't have to. Um, struggle cleaning the data because you would have had a system in place that uh, uh, verifies and cleans this data on a weekly basis. So yeah, like you mentioned, Doc, uh, the cleaning process is, is uh, what, what's involving, but I, again, I have to that depend on how good your system was from the point and during the point of data entry and also how frequent were you verifying some of the inconsistencies you are seeing in the data to the people in the field, the people actually collecting this data in the field. Um, once you have such a system set up, uh, uh, that's clear to the latter, uh, you will find that your data cleaning uh, is, not that uh, is not that involving. Uh, you just have minor uh, questions to, to ask and, and you, you easily resolve them. So yeah. Uh, that's it on the on, on, on the challenges, some of the challenges we face. Uh, in terms of the analysis, it, it, it's, 
if you have your clean data set, uh, it's pretty much straightforward. Uh, as long as you, um, uh, you have your analysis plan in place, uh, it's, it's not that difficult to actually analyze the data and get the, the answers to the questions you are asking of the data. Yeah. All right, so looking at the time, I don't know, Knox, do you want to ask a question and then? Uh... Um, yes, Doc, if I may be allowed. Yeah. Um, so, a quick one. How has, uh, if yes. the factory has have had any impact, sorry, I'm getting an echo, I'm not sure if it's my mic. Has the COVID-19 had um, any adverse impact on uh, the projects you're currently doing? I ask this because, uh, especially when, when you have people getting the data on the ground, you know, obviously COVID, we've been told that COVID-19 will have its own um, uh, symptoms and whatnot, fever, feverish, difficulties in breathing and all that. And let's say what the projects are working on involves maybe TB data. How has that uh, worked mm -hmm. so far for you? Because obviously some of the symptoms COVID will show, I mean, COVID-19 will have, may be related to uh, TB symptoms. So how, how has that worked for you? If, 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 um, if, 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 if you may maybe talk about any adverse impacts it, it has had. All right, thanks, uh, Knox, for your question. So yeah, uh, the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic has has affected some research projects. Uh, in fact, some of them have been halted uh, because they don't want to compromise the quality of, 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 of the results that might come uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, some have continued, um, but uh, to be honest, uh, they are not operating uh, as we would like. Uh, so uh there's a lot of improvisation that has gone on uh to kind of uh, uh ensure that this, uh, this some of these pro projects continue running but uh yeah like like, like i mentioned um some projects have been halted uh, and we've been yeah we've been affected by this uh, to be honest yeah okay okay yeah okay thanks All right. Uh, looking at the time, uh, I, I don't know if there's uh, any one last question. If any, we'll we'll take in this one last question before we close. Uh, and I'm assuming I think Shash has come up. I'm assuming uh, the our colleagues from Cyrus will be joining us again next week. To if if you're not available next week, I'm sure we can find the slot where. Maybe uh, Jack, Jacob can come and do his part of the presentation because I feel like it might. Uh, I was looking at the the abstract. Uh, maybe it might be of interest to uh, to our colleagues in Odin fifty-seven foot one and fifty-three ten actually. So, any last uh, one last question, if we can. No. Uh, I'll ask the closing question. <laughs> Sorry, I just find that. Sorry, I a lot connection. Okay, right. Thanks. So, uh, one last question for me here. Um, I'm interested in the, um, the the project that was conducted in these uh, is it correctional facilities. It, it appears to me like the the end goal, at least so far as deployment is concerned, is just on report generation. In the event that, uh, okay. Do you think that what you've done so far can be repurposed in such a manner that once the project is, is concluded, then you set up some sort of platform that is able to, let's say, classify a new inmate as being more at risk, for instance, like Lighton is arrested and he is locked up, for instance, would you be able to use demographic information to try and figure out if you know, he's more at risk of contracting TB or whatever? Do you think that the demographic information you are collecting can be repurposed for that sort of use case? Sure, Doc. Uh, that, that, actually, that's that's uh, correct. You can actually ascertain or or uh, predict the risk that light on uh, the example you gave 
uh, has to getting TB. I remember um, the, the study's main exposure of interest is the overcrowding, right? Uh, remember, like I mentioned, we know there's a bacteria that causes TB, right? But uh, if you are in an overcrowded place, we're trying to figure out uh, 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 the extent of the risk of you getting TB. So that's the reason why when we're doing the modeling, uh, remember there, there are people who are already in these prisons uh, and mass screening is conducted on them. So even when you're doing the analysis, you have to adjust for the type of prisoner you are, right? You are, if you're mass screened, meaning you've been in prison for a long time. So the possibility of having TB is high, but if you're entry screened, uh, you are from the community and hopefully the community that you are, you are staying in before you, you, you came into contact with the correctional facility is not uh, heavily burdened with TB disease, then you are at low risk. But because now you're going into a, an environment where you are highly at risk, uh, it, it's a source of concern. So even when you're building these uh, logistic regression models, you have to adjust for type of inmate, uh, whether you, you are uh, mass screened, meaning you've been in the prison for more than seven days or even more than a month or two or years, or if you're entry screen, you're just newly being introduced into that environment. Yeah. Yeah, and, and for those that are wondering, I mean, I'd like to think uh, screening costs money, right? So this this whole thing wouldn't really be feasible on a relatively large scale. Uh, so, I mean, if, if you're able to- Yeah. Someone who potentially has an illness and you can have like targeted screening, but that's what I was trying to get at here. Uh, I, I don't think, yes, I mean, I've, yes. I've been to some of these correctional facilities, not that I've been arrested, but I've been there, I've seen them. I, I don't think that we have the resources to do mass screening here, which is why this is being done with funding coming in from Oxford, right? So anyway. Yes, uh, exactly, yeah. Right. Thank you so much. We really appreciate this, uh, despite the circumstances, despite, despite the circumstances. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, we'll reach out to you to find out when Jacob can come through and do his uh, part of the presentation. Uh, we, we, I think we have two okay. more slots that are available. We can easily create another slot. Uh, yeah, very good. We just to mention, even though uh, we've been chatting to Shatra about this, but for the benefit of those that are in the, um, in the meeting that are attending, one of the reasons we're doing this is we're trying to, to see if we can uh, partner with uh, the experts working in industry um, and the way we see ourselves contributing is by providing uh, free labor, right? We, we always have students, final year students working on these projects and our thinking is that uh, we can potentially cover out some of these projects so that they, they solve more meaningful problems that we're experiencing as a society. So uh, just a point to note here. Um, we want to gravitate away towards working on more academic oriented problems, right? Uh, uh, I plan to give a talk very soon, and I'm sure people will be wondering why it is I waste my time doing that, but I don't see it as a waste of time. But anyway, thank you so much. We really appreciate this. And to the participants, we are very grateful that you stuck around, right, for almost two and a half hours now. Um, the recording will be shared. It's just that the editing can be a pain sometimes, and especially with what happened here, I don't look forward to editing this out edit it quickly and then I will share the link as soon as it is done. So thank you so much. And for you know, seven foot one students, if you could just stick around just for a quick chat and, and then thank you so much. You are free to leave now. Great. Cheers. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.